Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm Bob Shrum, the director of the Center for the Political Future. This is a political conversation uh, jointly hosted by us in the Political Science Department. I have a few quick announcements. Uh, next Tuesday, February 26th, we will host the New York Times LA Bureau Chief Adam Nagurney, former Obama campaign manager and CNN commentator Stephanie Cutter, and political science professor Jane Jun here at Ground Zero to talk about the increasingly crowded Democratic field for 2020. Our Climate Forward Conference is coming on Thursday, April 4th. John Kerry will be keynoting at Bovard, followed by a full day of expert panels at Town & Gown. Admission is free for students. Undergraduate students of any major are invited to apply to become student delegates to the conference. Student delegates will have priority seating for the conference and the keynote on April 4th and can attend an all-expense-paid post-conference retreat at the USC Wrigley Marine Science Center on Catalina Island on April 5th. Delegates will participate in workshops and work closely with experts to distill key learning from the conference for dissemination. Uh, tonight's event is being broadcast on Facebook Live, as usual, uh, and I'm going to introduce the first of our guests, and my co-director, Mike Murphy, will introduce the second. Uh, Lou Sussman, sitting right next to Mr. Murphy, was a senior advisor to President Obama's campaign, was the national finance chairman for Senator Kerry's 2004 presidential campaign, uh, and was a major fundraiser and force uh, in 2008. He served as U.S. Ambassador to the Court of St. James to Great Britain from 2009 to 2013, uh, from 2012 to 2017, I wonder why that was the date when it ended. He was a member of the Secretary of State's Foreign Affairs Policy Board. Also, and not least, he's been a close friend of mine for a third of a century. Mike? Thank you, Bob, and welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm the guy who often spends all the money in a campaign, so I take a very sharp professional interest in fundraising and fundraisers. And I can tell you, after 30 years in the Republican Party, that Jack Oliver, our guest here tonight on the Republican side, is universally known as the best Republican fundraiser in presidential politics, bar none. I'll give you a quick trip through the resume. He knows politics, too. He's a former CEO of the Republican National Committee, the National Finance Co-Chairman of Bush Cheney 2004, the National Finance Director for George W. Bush's successful campaign in 2000, and the National Co-Chair, Political and Finance, of Jeb Bush's campaign in 2016, where he raised a tremendous amount of money, breaking records on every level until I screwed everything up in the campaign on the political side. So he's a dear friend, and before any of you liberals get too worried, he also served, because uh, he's very, excuse me, very involved in philanthropy as co-chair of Bono's One Campaign for two years. These days he works for Doc Square. He runs, he is Doc Square Capital, and is a practice leader at the Brian Cave Law Firm. So it's great to have both Ambassador Sussman and my dear friend Jack Oliver here today. And I'm going to start with a question I'm going to direct to Lou, uh, and then Jack can comment if he wants. How has presidential campaign fundraising changed over the years? It's gotten more expensive, that's for sure. Uh, I would tell you that the biggest change I've seen has been the Internet. Uh, my uh, campaigns, 90% uh, of the money was raised in fundraisers, large and small. Uh, when John Kerry, uh, well, I hate to tell you this, but I go back to Teddy Kennedy, and uh, they never had anything called the Internet. And it's changed everything. If you look today, uh, Bernie Sanders, who announced for the presidency, um, has over a million donors on on his uh, internet. Uh, he got uh, seven, 80 percent in 2016 of his money came in through that. Uh, Beto O'Rourke in Texas against Cruz, 78 percent of his money came in through the internet, and including uh, one quarter he raised 38 million dollars. And the basic wonderful thing about that is the fact that somebody gives you. 35 or 50 dollars, which is about the, the max, uh, you got their vote. They've got invested. And it's pretty easy to go back and ask for another 25 or 50 dollars. So it's a, Bob, it's a whole new game. Uh, I don't think the traditional fundraising will be eliminated. I just think its importance will be less. 
I, I would first of all thank you for hosting us tonight. It's, I'm honored to be on the stage with my friend, Ambassador Lou Sussman. I tell everybody when I grow up, I want to be Lou Sussman. So it's an honor to be with him tonight. He's exactly right. What the Internet has done is it democratized fundraising. So everybody can have a voice. You can have a voice as much as you want. Uh, and and it's it's empowering. What what you saw in the last cycle was uh, it was Bernie Sanders against when he ran against Hillary Clinton. The internet fundraising for him was the was his voice, and it be, became almost such that he beat the party establishment, but for uh, but for the super delegates. And she had all the money, but he ended up having all the money from all the people. And it's exactly what what Lou said, which is it, not only do you get their money, you get their vote. And it's you know it's seven dollars, it's thirteen dollars, and once you're invested, you're probably paying more attention on television. This is one of the phenomenons of Donald Trump is how much money he's been able to raise online and. Um, and so you will see that continue to grow, and it, the numbers will be extraordinary in this cycle. Uh, and frankly, it's also a very cost-effective uh, piece of fundraising. One thing people don't, don't realize is how much time it takes to actually raise money uh, when you're having to contact and be with people both on the phone and in, in person. So it is, a, it is an empowerment vehicle uh, for, for people all over the country. I just want to add one last thing I meant to say. As you use the Internet, the crucial thing is the message. Uh, when John Kerry was running, it was anti-Bush. When uh, Obama was running, it was first anti-Clinton and a, a hope and an optimistic vote. And you'll see t in this, this new round what the message is going to be. My guess is the Democrats will favor towards anti-Trump. I would. And... Uh, it's, uh, it's I can a, tell you that uh, AOC and the Green New Deal will be on the Internet fundraising for Donald Trump. So yeah. you're going to see uh, it, – because you're trying to drive your emotions, and the, uh, people do a lot of giving in terms of emotional giving. Um, let me ask the next question, and we're to zero in a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. We, we've named this panel, so you need $100 million. And then we put on a subtext or a subtitle, well, maybe make that a billion. So I'm sure, Ambassador, your phone is ringing off the hook, and Jack, you're a keen observer of how the finance dynamics work. If you're one of this gamut of Democratic candidates now sensing opportunity against the president, seeing the Democratic nomination is worth something a lot, and you're starting to compete, and they called you up, what would you tell them they have to raise to get from here to just the New Hampshire primary, the first real <laughs> filter in early February? What do you think the range is? And you might explain how the federal system works. Because a lot of people think you just call up Putin or the Koch brothers and get a trillion dollars. So There's actually limits. There are limits. Uh, individuals can give $2,600 per person per cycle. So what, be what becomes important outside the parties is people who have spheres of influence, friends, people they know from synagogue, mask, church, mosque, church, soccer teams, organizational structures where they have lots of friends. And those people are called bundlers, and they're very important. If you think about it, those of you who studied, it, running for president is like taking a company public. When you really have institutional investors in the body of politic, and those people are people who have the ability to not only have influence, whether it's union organizers or grassroots organizers or people who have the ability to raise large sums of money. And so those people right now are looking at, do I go early? Because if you go early, there's a, a, a higher likelihood that you're going to be in the inner circle of what a campaign might look like. Do I have passion about somebody? Have I been a 30-year friend of somebody? And the, the Republicans are obviously uh, – primarily focused on President Trump and his reelection, uh, but the Democrats obviously have a lot of people running. And so the, uh, the, the attempt to get these important bundlers and or grassroots organizers involved in your campaign, both at the political level and the financial level, is the major focus of most of these uh, people, most of the men and women running for president right now. And it's their, their value proposition is extraordinarily high because you really do, especially the way the primary is set with California going so early, you can turn it on very quickly if you have a fundraising base, and high, especially if you have uh, what you, Beto O'Rourke or, or um, Bernie or Elizabeth Warren all have large numbers of people they can raise money from on the Internet. But if you're Senator, uh, Vice President Biden or some of these other people who are very well known but don't have large numbers of people who've given to them on the Internet, the bundler system is much more important. Lou, talk about bundlers for a minute if you can. Where do you find them? Well, I can only tell you that in uh, John Kerry's campaign, I put together a group of 10, what I called my executive committee, which were large fundraisers.
from all around the country, and they had to commit to raise $2 million each, and the only way they could do it was $2,600 at a pop. So they would get their, their lawyer, their investment banker, all these people to give, and they would bundle it, and that's what a bundler is. Uh, I don't know any other way to explain it uh, than that. Uh, it's like Jack said, it's, you're, you're uh, putting as many investors together as you can. But I, you asked me about how much we go in, in the early stages. Let me tell you something about the Democrats. Uh, it's crazy that a state called Iowa has so much influence in the election. Uh, obviously, uh, New Hampshire's next. In, uh, in uh, 1980, when Teddy Kennedy ran against Jimmy Carter, uh, no one thought he would do well, and he did better than they thought. But when John Kerry ran against, at that point, it was Howard Dean before he got to the Republicans, and Dean was a populist, and go ahead, we spent every single penny we had in Iowa. And what the idea was, if we didn't do well in Iowa, it was over anyway. And if we did do well, we had a plan to immediately contact the people that had given us money to go another round with them. Same thing was true with Obama. In his first race against Clinton, uh, how do you get a, uh, a black man to show well in Iowa, which is predominantly a white state, and they went all out. David Axelrod and David Plouffe spent e practically every penny we had. And then that catapults you going forward, uh, whether it's New Hampshire or now South Carolina or Super Tuesday, et cetera. So the bottom line is how much do you need in Iowa? And Iowa's a crazy state. It's a caucus state. So it's not like you're getting votes. You gotta go identify your, your uh, voters, get them to the caucus, understand the caucus rules, which are really different. I always say that the primary system is worse than a colonostomy. It's, just, it's, it's nothing could be worse. So I can suggest to you that in today's world, television's important, uh, very important, very expensive, but it depends on the market. Uh, it isn't very expensive in Iowa, uh, except if you use the Chicago or uh, Kansas City markets. You go to California, it's going to cost you a bloody fortune. Again, back to the Internet and the importance of it, it also expedites your ability to take a win in one of those early primary states and catapult it onto the national stage. So, again, that just reiterates what the, what the ambassador said. It's expensive to run for president. You've got to raise a lot of money, but, you know, it is a pretty important job. And, uh, and, and so one of the things you want to be able to demonstrate is whether or not you can bring resources together, not only financially but organizationally as well. And these early primary states, the activists end up being more important than the, the people raising money in the individual states. So we go out and raise money from all over California, New York, Florida, uh, Chicago, and then we go spend it all in Iowa and New Hampshire and South Carolina in hopes we win a couple of these early primary states, and if we do, we can catapult it on. I have a question. I know this is silly, but has anybody here ever given to a campaign? It's interesting. You shouldn't have done that. They're both going to jump you after you vent to double the number. Uh, so a quick Iowa story because was a, Ambassador Sussman is so right about how an Iowa caucus works. I'll never forget the first one I worked in the mid-90s. Uh, the governor at the time was a client and said, look, I'm not going to endorse your candidate. I'm not going to endorse anybody, uh, but I'm for your guy. So I'm giving you the most valuable gift in Iowa caucus politics. Hands me an envelope. I open it up, and it's the home phone number, and some of them had cell phones then, of the top 200 rural veterinarians in Iowa. Because you caucus in a rural county, nobody wants to piss off the vet. They're going to call in the middle of the night to come out to their farm in 10-degree weather. <laughs> and so if you got the vet, the d crowd dynamic power is incredible. That's the kind of stuff you don't see on polls. So uh, what I often hear from kind of civilians is, oh, I know how this works. You give your maximum of 2,600 or get your 10 friends to do it in bundle. But that's because these people all want road contracts. You know, they pay to get. So I'd ask our guest, in your experience, is that really true? Because I think it's a mis misnomer. Why do people give? Well, I think uh, people would give uh, mainly emotionally. Uh, who do they feel 
is the person they want and they feel an emotional attachment. Uh, I've seen it time and time again. And for an example, in the Bush uh, race against Kerry, uh, Iraq w was a big issue, a big issue. I, I tell the story, by the way, Professor Shrum was running that campaign, so you all should know that. Uh, but um, I'll never, and it's, it's changed, it's generational. I'll never forget, we had two fabulous people from Stanford that came to see me, and they said, Mr. Sussman, we have a great idea that we can raise $7 million in 10 days. I looked at them that they were crazy. And uh, I said, first place, don't call me Mr. Sussman. It's my father. I'm Lou. They said, yes, Mr. Sussman. And uh, uh, I said, what do you want? He said, we want these 10 names to write a letter for us, which we'll send out over 10 days. And it was uh, Jimmy Carter. It was uh, uh, Madeleine Albright. It was a whole series of those type of people. And uh, they had a thermometer on the Internet. And I looked at them like they were crazy, but I got them the 10 names. We did 7,800,000 in 10 days. And what's so interesting about this is why do people give? They give for lots of different reasons. But may, the person to ask them may be the reason they gave. They give emotionally. They give because they like the candidate or don't like the other candidate. They give because they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves, You know, whether it's a $10 check or a $2,600 check. Um, so, yes, there's, there's lots of different reasons people give to politics. Uh, it's part of the process. It's always been part of the process. Uh, and, and it, you know, it, it does get a lot of – there are a lot of misunderstandings and misnomers about it. And now, you know, the truth is with some of these super PACs, you have individuals on the left and on the right who can't coordinate with the campaign, and they don't coordinate with the campaign. And sometimes they go out and put messages on television that are frankly not helpful to your candidacy. Uh, but, but people with a tremendous amount of resources spend a lot of money on – on politics just like they do on other things. And so you have this giant ecosystem of, the, of, of politics that now it is changed, really has changed Washington for, for some people would say the good, I would say the bad, because there's a permanent campaign. Uh, when, uh, when in the 80s and in, even into the late 80s and the early 90s, my great friend in, uh, in life, President George H.W. Bush died this year, Jeb's uh, dad and mom. And you know, in his, in his generation, you did have politics, but politics ended, and then you tried to actually get something done. And what we've seen with the proliferation of uh, news stations and, and kind of your own ability to create your own news vacuum with people who agree with you on 99% of the things that you think is it never stops. And so no matter which side you might be on, uh, the permanent campaign has taken our ability to kind of work across party lines because the, the extremes of both parties now – drive a lot of both the grassroots organizational structure fundraising and the primary process. And as a result, there's no benefit for a man or woman who's a Republican or Democrat working across party lines to try to actually accomplish something for the good of the country. I hate to be a cynic, but I think you'll understand. Guess what? Somebody might want to give money to get a job. Uh, and uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been said, well, how much money do I have to, to give uh, to be an ambassador? Or how much money do I have to give to be something? Well, that's the first place it's against the law. So that was the easy answer. But don't think that it's totally uh, uh, virtuous. Well, I'm not trying, I don't want to take away all their, you know, their idealism about yeah. politics. Uh, yeah, the, my favorite thing when somebody asks that question is, where do you want me to send the check back to? So uh, that goes on, but not really. It's, a, it's an overblown piece. And, you know, the, the truth is you create a series of friends throughout this process. And you, and you try to accomplish what it is you're trying to set out to do. Uh, you mentioned super PACs. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to us about super PACs, how they work, and about dark money issue adv advocacy groups that don't even have to report their donors. So I know it's two different questions. Two different questions. Super PACs are organizational structures that you file with the uh, election commission so that you know that who is giving money to that super PAC. Uh, and then any expenditures by that super PAC is is um, is on television. Why have a super PAC, though? Uh, Why not just give to the campaign? Because the campaign is limited in the amount of money you can raise, and so there are people who want to give more than $2,600, and the law technically allowed it, and, and it was created, and it was off and running. But you're not allowed to coordinate, unfortunately. I never got to talk to Mike after we announced whatever that was. So, uh, But super PACs are disclosed. Uh, 
I don't the dark money or whatever. There are there is a mechanism in the law that allows you to if you issue advocacy under uh, the tax code. Uh, that money is under uh, a C4 disclosure and is not disclosed. And a lot of people are very critical on the left and on the right about these issue campaigns that are run uh, external to the campaigns uh, themselves. And frankly, to be honest with you, most of them end up being worse for the candidate than if they wouldn't have done it. But it is a very controversial piece uh, because you have people not knowing where the money is coming from. And at least on, on the Republican side of the aisle, we, our whole goal was for disclosure and transparency so that you can figure out where the money's coming from. If you don't like that, you don't like the money or the people that are supporting your candidate or the person against you, you have the greatest thing you can do in the world, which is vote against them. And that's why transparency is so important. But, um, but uh, there's two types of super PACs. Uh, uh, Hillary Clinton had a super PAC in which people could give money to her campaign, could cover some of her expenses, would could take care of certain things that they didn't have to spend the money on with the $2,600. Uh, but they could not, they could not coordinate with the campaign, which was BS, because they figured out a way to do it. But then there's the super PAC that's run by the Association of Pharmaceuticals, and they uh, were uh, issue packs that they could go and if um, Hillary Clinton was against uh, pharmacy uh, pharmacies against pharmaceuticals, uh, they ran issue ads, and while they never mentioned Clinton, they they, they could definitely uh, influence the election. The other pack, the dark money, Bob talks about. I believe that one of the greatest threats to democracy was the United case that the Supreme Court said, which people could give unlimited money and you didn't have to say where it came from. Uh, I think that is dangerous. I think it is uh, pro uh, shouldn't be allowed. I'm hoping one of these days the Congress will reverse that through legislation. But when you have somebody uh, like the Koch brothers. Or like, Tom Steyer. Or Tom Steyer or whoever uh, can give dark money it's, um, it works on both sides of the aisle, but I'm telling you, it's dangerous. You should be against it. And my favorite thing about the country today is people are so much more in able to get information. And so people are, I think, making uh, educated, much educated um, decisions based on that, which is something that's very important, as I said, with regard to disclosure. Not to sound like the campaign accountant, but I want to just quickly rehash this because it's such a complicated thing, but it's very important. <clears throat> I run for president. I go to Bob. Bob says, I'm for you. What can I do? I'll give you $2,600, the limit, not from a corporation, from an individual. I say, great. That's my favorite kind of money. Now get 50 friends to do it. Call Ambassador Sussman to figure out how to do that. Because I can use that money to pay for my hotel room in New Hampshire to hire an organizer to make an ad where I'm talking. Then Bob says, I want to give you a million dollars. Well, the campaign can't take that. But the super PAC run by my friends can. Now, they can't talk to me. But they kind of know what I want. They do their own polling. They do their own stuff. They do their own TV, although I can't show up and do a filming with them. So it's easier to raise, but it's clumsier money, but it's disclosed. And more importantly, and also, Mike, it's yeah. also ten times more expensive, right? So yes. in, in New Hampshire, the your candidate committee gets a discounted rate, whereas – there's no for TV, for ads. TV ads, but super PACs don't get that, and the TV stations love it. Yeah, they gouge them. They have no right to the air. So you could have two spots running on New Hampshire on the news, one a candidate paid $500 for, and right after it a super PAC spot that cost 6000 So it's kind of a weird thing, but that becomes an arms race. Then finally, Bob says, well, I would give you a million, but it turns out I'm a massive uh, uh, criminal, and I, I don't want to read my name in the paper. Well, then you could give to the dark money committee, which doesn't report its donors. But the ads they run have to be different. One, they get hit on the same high rates by TV, and their ads say, hey, if you like ice cream, vote for Mike Murphy. If you don't like ice cream, call up Jack Oliver and ask him why he murdered seven ice cream vendors. Here's his it phone It literally number. is that stupid. Yeah, it really is that dumb. And there are, there are certain controls. So the dark money is more controlled. The truth is... There wasn't that much dark money in the Republican primary. Marco Rubio was the only guy who had a big committee doing kind of those half ads. 
But I, I'm, I'm with, I think, uh, Jack and uh, Lou on this. The dark money is not only a problem because it does allow mystery, no disclosure. It often works like a hand grenade rolling around on its own out of control. And that's where some of the slippery stuff happens. So um, super PACs, I think, and I just ran the biggest Republican one ever, thanks to a lot of money Jack and, and Jeb raised. And they have a certain limited utility because you can't really get the, use it to, you can argue for the candidate, but the candidate can't be inside it, so you don't have that authenticity. That said, it can be helpful. And it's a boom area. People are raising a lot. You know, the other question is, there's a famous uh, uh, California politician named Jeffrey Je Unruh, and uh, he said the mother milk of politics is money. Uh, how do you get money out of these things? Uh, do you have to be a millionaire? a multimillionaire to run. I think the internet has kind of modified that a lot, where in the past it was easier. Uh, I worked with um, a number of people, uh, both across the aisle from uh, Russ Feingold to, to McCain, to try and figure out if we could figure a way for Fender f for, to um, uh, take money out of it and have it funded by the federal government. Do you know who was against it the most? the incumbent politicians, because they knew they could raise money and they had an unfair level, a playing field to somebody that came in. And it's been batted around how to do it, etc. You should know, which is one of the only, only disagreements I've had with uh, Professor Shrum, in the federal, when you get to the, out of the primaries, you can opt out for government money which has a limit on it, but you don't have to raise any. And uh, we decided to, to take that money for reasons. Bob thought it was a mistake. He could be right in retrospect. But you do get money out of the politics in the past where both candidates took the federal money. Uh, I'm not sure they do it anymore. No, I don't think anyone will ever do it again because you have raised and the Internet had raised $250 million for John Kerry before the convention. He had his convention five weeks before Bush. He had to live when he took federal money on the same amount of money for a 13-week campaign that Bush had for a five-week campaign. So Barack Obama looked at this and in 2008 said, I'm not taking federal money. McCain took federal money and was <laughs> tremendously outspent. And in, since then, no candidate of either party for president has has taken federal money, and they won't. I mean, look, it's. I mean, we spend you know, five billion dollars a year in pornography, in the in the country, and we spend a billion dollars every four year elected president. So, I mean, it kind of you put it in context. Uh, it, it's not a lot of money in the overall cross seas of the world. That being said, I go back to what I said the first time. The internet has empowered people's voice in a way that no nothing you've ever seen has been able to do to get people that can give small amounts of money. Because if you, with the right idea and the right personality, I mean, look, look at the race in Texas. I mean, uh, Beto O'Rourke raised a tremendous amount of money. Uh, his average contribution was teeny. It was from all over the country. And he people, never held a fundraiser. I don't, I don't know if he had a fundraiser or not. He didn't need to. And by the way, remember, it doesn't cost money to utilize the Internet, so it's a very, value, very powerful thing. Yeah, because when you do the high-dollar money, the $2,600 parties with 30 of your friends, you got to fly in the candidate. You got to hire staff. There's going to be a nice sculpture of a big eagle. Uh, eagle. So there's cost. Well, the internet is very, is, as as internet people say, low friction, which means you can capture 94 cents on the buck given to you, and nothing can beat that. And times a million people, it's a lot of money. So here's a question for you guys about the mechanics of all this. Right now, you got a bunch of Democratic candidates running. How do they go about courting these bundlers? You know, I've got to build. The, yeah. How how do they go out and recruit them? How do if let's say I'm Amy Klobuchar now and I've got five bundlers in Minnesota and somebody I went to law school with who lives in Nevada? How do I get the other of the known hundred? How do I go get them? How do I compete? Well, the first thing is there'll be some people she doesn't even know say I want to be for Amy Klobuchar and will become a bundler. The second thing is you use the network of the bundlers you have to find other bundlers. Um, as much as bundlers are important today. They're not going to go out of style, but their importance is substantially diminished because of the Internet. And uh, 
I always said on bundlers, the only two bu things uh, two bundlers could decide is what the third bundler should give, and uh, <laughs> uh, it's a uh, it's a it's a tough go, but you know, I can only tell you you got to ask yourself the question: with all this money is going to be spent, where it's a hundred million, or as Bob and, and Mike said, a billion dollars, how do you get money out of politics? How do you create a system that whatever it is uh, and uh, I would tell you that uh, I worked hard on it and failed failed um, if you're a, a well-known bundler from some part of the country uh, you, the, the every one of these people knows when your birthday is they know your children's names they know uh, what your hobbies are they know if you if they, they've been they've tried to see you when they were in the Senate or in the Congress or a governor to build a relationship uh, to, and so you get to know them so that you can take this personal aspect of it and add to it a s series of ideology that you're strongly excited about. So it's a process that is uh, time-consuming uh, and, and, and can be uh, not a fun and favorite thing of a candidate. Uh, but but in, 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 this, in this world that we live in, uh, it's, it's part of the process. It is, it is very difficult uh, to get people to commit early, especially if you have lots of candidates, unless they think you're going to win. Uh, the most important ideology in a year when you have uh, either you're running against a, uh, after eight years of President Obama or you're running after four years of President Donald Trump, the most important thing that a donor, just like for most part activists, is, is your ability to win the election. And so these candidates will be able to show polling that shows them early doing well against President Trump uh, will have a, an added advantage uh, when they're talking to either you on the Internet or on whatever mechanism by which you're getting your news or whether they're, they're flying to Chicago to see Ambassador Sussman. One thing is important we did in this. It's called list. Uh, all these people need list. How do they reach you? How do they entice you? What's their message they give to you? Bernie Sanders has a list of almost a million people. Beto O'Rourke's got 800,000. I venture to say that Amy Klobuchar, if she's lucky, got 200,000, 200, if that. And so she has, to she has to create lists for this Internet to work. And a lot of these lists are bought and sold back and forth. Uh, it's a big business. Uh, I, uh, I feel that... Um, I'm, at my age, I'm getting a little tired of dial, dialing for dollars, but uh, I would tell you, uh, you can't make it without the money. So I want to shift gears for a second, and I'll, I'll give this to you first, Lou, and then you comment on, comment on it, especially on the left. Contributions from Wall Street can be viewed as a negative for a candidate. We saw this with Hillary Clinton, the speeches she was paid to give, the folks who gave her money. Uh, uh, we're starting to hear a similar criticism of Cory Booker. Uh, can a Democratic candidate be successful post Bernie Sanders and still take big contributions from corporate executives or Wall Street investors? Uh, I don't think they can do it if they're getting paid $250,000 for a speech. Uh, that doesn't work anymore. But you go to Goldman Sachs and they put a group together of 50 of their partners and each of them give $2,600, and their wife gives $2,600. That's called high-class bundlers. And I think that um, uh, only Elizabeth Warren, I think, would uh, criticize that. But I don't think anybody else would because they're all doing the same thing. I think your point is if it looks like you're being bought uh, by Wall Street, then you've got a problem. Each party has a group of people that they, they – they become the the uh, uh, the the people that you don't want to be involved with well, on the Democratic side. You don't. I can't imagine uh, Elizabeth Warren raising money from the NRA or Goldman Sachs or others. Uh, we to be successful uh, in a presidential campaign, you need to raise money from all kinds of people, and um, and so I think the degree to which there will be heat given to. Uh, the Democrats who go into Wall Street and raise resources. It's kind of an interesting thing because if you go back and look at a lot of the tr cabinet secretaries uh, that we've had on the Democratic side, a lot of them have come out of Wall Street, and Wall Street is not a bad place. There are bad people on Wall Street just like there are bad people in Hollywood. And um, 
And so I, I'm one who hopes that uh, if there's a nice, good liberal Democrat in Goldman Sachs who wants Elizabeth Warren to be president, that he or she uh, should be able to do whatever they want to try to get that done. And if that means bringing together some of their friends with their their partners and the other people in their in their world to try to raise money for them, more power too. I don't think she'll take money from it because I think she thinks it's an activist issue that can fire up the base against a Joe Biden, against somebody that's more of an establishment person. But I, we'll see. I, 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 it'll be interesting to see. This is kind of more inside baseball stuff than I think the general public is focused on uh, because, you know, Barack Obama took plenty of money from Wall Street. I know, but, but if you look at what happened in 2016, uh, when Hillary Clinton was asked in a debate whether she'd reveal her the text of her Wall Street speeches, so they, they, uh, she way, said, I will if everybody else will reveal those. And Bernie threw his hands up and said, here's mine. I never gave any. Right. The, the debts uh, are and it different became a big than, issue. And it is different than raising money. That's exactly. So she got paid $250,000 a speech when she was a private citizen to go speak. And that with the Clinton Foundation probably created more problems than they would like to have done. But I do think it will be an issue debate because if you're – the 12th person on the on the stage, and you're trying to get recognized. If this is something that can provide sensational television, you're probably going to jump up. Let me ask a contrarian question. Then I know we got to go to audience Q and A. But I think we've all agreed that the rise of the internet means a way to democratize fundraising. Lots of people giving a smaller amount, responding to a message or a huge candidate list, as opposed to the bundlers. But a lot of the bundlers I've met are ultra pragmatic. I don't think there's a lot of enthusiasm at the leadership level of the Democratic Party for Bernie to run again. In the old days, Bernie would go up in front of 100 bundlers, and they'd say, hey, you're a loser, take a hike. You know, maybe he had relationships of five or six. But it would be a chilling effect. Now, because he has his own list, he can blow away what Kamala Harris wrote, uh, raised in 24 hours in just four hours because his loyal people are there. So is the decline of bundlers necessarily a good thing? Or does it open it up and maybe there's less discipline and pragmatism at the top of the finance machine that makes candidacies possible or not in the primary? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let Lou uh, give, give comment to that. I would say this. Anybody who is interested in politics but wants to give money at the grassroots level or at the bundler's level, there's a process by which you make a determination on why you're doing it and how you're doing it. And if you're going to run for president – he or she, the person needs to be able to figure out how to communicate with both those people. They're both important part of the processes. Uh, you know, uh, you, the la head of labor unions are very important people, uh, and, and they, because they represent a lot of people. Uh, the head of these different groups are important because they, they're there to represent a lot of people. Bundlers are no different. Uh, they're, in, m in most cases, motivated by uh, trying to do what they think is best for the country, just like people who give money. I do think that I do think, as we said earlier, the Internet has changed the ability of the organizational structure and leadership in, in both the Democratic National Committee and the third-party groups that make up the leadership of the Democrats and the same thing on the right. It has taken their power down in determining who the nominee, whoever she, she or he may be. And I think that's the thing that's changed as a result of super PACs and people who have lots of money and want to get involved and, more importantly, the rise of the grassroots fundraising. Would, would, would Bernie Sanders be a viable candidate 25 or 30 years ago? I don't think so. Because? I don't, I don't think he could raise the money. Uh, but um, I think you got to, if you're going to run for a national office, you can't eliminate any source of fair legal revenue. Right. And whether it's a bundler or it's a thing, you will see, though, a number of the candidates, and I don't know how many have already done it, will not accept money from PACs for PACs. Uh, they feel that uh, the influence is undue, they, the image is bad, whatever it might be. Uh, I, I don't know. I know Warren has. I know that Bernie has. And I don't know where the rest of them have come out on that. But let me also tell you a story that uh, I know. Uh, when the Kennedy family ran... They had terrific fundraisers that were for teas, uh, for luncheons, where they gave 100 bucks a pop. And those were bundlers bringing in $100 a pop. You can do it at the ground level if you got the right candidate and the right issues. It's an enormously organiz or organization thing. But I can't impress upon you enough that 
If somebody gives you 50 bucks, you got their vote. That is crucial. And you're probably going to get another $50. Right. Because they're already invested, just like you invested in the things you believe in and the things you, you're, you're involved with. Bob, shall we go to Q&A? Yeah, I think we should open this up to Q&A from the audience. There's someone out there with a mic. So he's over there. Just put your hands up. Gentleman in the back. Hi there. So um, on this subject of um, ex exceedingly wealthy individuals trying to buy their way into positions, it seems like in this previous election we have several mega donors of Donald Trump who have made his way into his cabinet. For example, the DeVos family who donated millions of dollars or uh, what have you. You have – I'm blanking up here. But it does seem that that's kind of unenforceable even if you do see some really apparent connections. Well, I would go back to uh, President Obama's cabinet. Uh, oh, there was a wonderful woman, Penny Pritzker, out of Chicago, who was his finance chairman who served as the Commerce Department. Look, uh, people, uh, you're going to choose people that you're close to and you think will do a good job. It's up to you all to decide whether or not that's the case or not. I can't speak for President Trump or the cabinet involved. You, with you don't want to speak for President Trump? Uh, no. Uh, um, I, but, uh, you know, President Bush put good friends of his around his cabinet some of whom gave money to us, some of whom did not. Uh, that wasn't the qualifying factor as to whether or not you want to put somebody in a cabinet. One of the things that I think is so interesting and in what people that don't – aren't involved in this is one of the things President Trump did was he was new to this process. So all of the kind of institutional people on the Republican side that you would know, governors, senators, congresswomen, congressmen, people that were involved in commerce, he didn't know them. And then he won, and I don't. And, and most people didn't think that was going to happen either. So he had to. He put a cabinet together very quickly. I'm not questioning or judging those. He's put a lot of really good people on there. I, I, I put Jim Mathis in the cabinet of any place I ever did. I do the same with Mike Pompeo. I do this. I mean, I could we can go down the list. There are some extraordinary people that Gary Cohen, who worked in the White House, Dean Powell. These are extraordinary people. In some cases, are Democrats. So were there friends of his who gave money? I'm sure there were. That is not a Republican unique thing to Republicans. It happens on the Democratic side uh, just as well. Um, and the good news is is in every the Senate then con confirms or denies that person, and then you have a chance to see what how he or she may do, and you judge on the outside. Uh, I think, um, again, being the cynic in the crowd, uh, I know, and this is public, I'm not telling these stories, but the president ambassador of the Court of St. James is the owner of the New York Jets, um, My good friend. Your good friend. Uh, New York Jets football team and his heir to the Johnson & Johnson fortune. And he gave $3.5 million to the Trump campaign. Now, how did he give $3.5 million? Well, he gave to the Republican Party. He gave to super PACs, wherever. Uh, I would only suggest to you that um, – whether it's true or not, there's more rich Republicans than there are Democrats. I wish it was true. I, unfortunately, in the world, it's not. I mean, especially if you're out here, my friend. I mean, you know, we, you, you can go up and down Hollywood Hills. and It's and, a fair fight. This is, this is a better fundraiser, better fundraising area for you, oh, just but, like San Francisco. But what I wanted to say is, is that people that were chosen for the Obama candidate, uh, cabinet, I can honestly say because Jim Johnson was involved and I was involved, I don't know anyone that, quote, bought their way in. I, I certainly wasn't suggesting anyone did. I just wanted to say there were people involved in both campaigns that ended up being involved in it. Penny Pritzker is an extraordinary human being. She did a great job for President Obama. I'd say it if she was sitting right here. But just because you give money to somebody you believe in and you give time of it, that doesn't necessarily make you a nefarious person. It also means there probably there may be other people. But, uh, but, but just so you know, that's not that doesn't automatically – become something that's nefarious. And just very quickly, I feel like I have to say something about Betsy DeVos. I, I, I've been anti-Trump since 1992. I'm wondering where all the Johnny will come lately uh, came from. Uh, and you can decide whether Betsy DeVos ought to be or shouldn't be education secretary. I will say, going back to John Engler's campaign in 1990, which I ran in Michigan, she's been involved in education reform for a long time at a high level. So. She does have credentials in education reform. It's not like she woke up one day and decided, you know, I, I don't want to buy a Ming vase. I'm going to buy a sec education. It's just not accurate. Nor have they been the biggest mega donors in the party. That said, it is a long American tradition, particularly in the ambassador area, that often 
donors who are also fairly accomplished people often wind up in service as ambassadors. Go ahead, Lou, and then we'll get another question. I, I also think uh, that we haven't mentioned some outside groups. For an example, how much did the NRA spend in the last election? I have no idea. How much did the uh, uh, union spend I, in Tom, the last election? I don't know how election? much did Tom, Tom Steyer spend. Yeah, and all I'm suggesting to you, there are people with definite parochial issues they deal with. One of the largest contributors to the campaign are people that uh, were in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, they call up the pharmaceutical industry and they said, we're having an inaugural where you give a $1 a million dollars. Well, yeah. are they going to say no to Trump's finance chairman at this point? So there's all that money. And, and that, unfortunately, Lou, as you know, is not a Republican problem. It happened the same thing with President Obama. Oh, yeah. I'm they not said, saying, so, I'm I mean, saying they got the same a, phone call. There, there's a special interest. Special that, that, interest. So okay. They're out there. So this gentleman here paid a million to ask the next question? Oh, I thought your hand was up. Who, who do we have? There you go. Half a million. Thank you so much for coming out. It's been really interesting to hear your perspective so far. Um, I recently read that President Trump has raised an unprecedented amount at this point for the 2020 election. I believe it's over $100 million. And I was wondering, do you see that continuing to increase in like 2024? Um, or do you think that he's a bit of an anomaly? Um, I think that, as I said earlier, the campaign never stopped. Uh, I don't think the campaign will stop. Uh, if, I don't, and I don't, if a Democrat wins, I don't think their campaign will stop either. But, Jack, you can correct me. Trump has been an underperformance in traditional no, 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 no. finance it, 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 levels. The President, President Trump has raised a ton of money online, a ton. Yeah, online. And that's been a mechanism for him. He, he has not stopped the political conversation. Decide whether you will, whether it's good or bad. He has not stopped the political conversation. And so he, the, that has not stopped. And it, whether you're on Facebook or some other place and getting the advertising, that's been a big part of what he's done. So I don't think that's going to stop. As I said, we've really stopped since 1996, maybe, uh, from 90, maybe 2000, maybe 2004. But it, 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 it doesn't, politics doesn't stop anymore. Um, the day you get elected, whether you're Republican or Democrat to Congress, you're trying to figure out whether or not you're going to get reelected or to the Senate or – are you going to term limit out so you can run for governor? I mean, it, these, are, these are people who spend a lot of time thinking about those things. Just put this in perspective. Uh, 30 years ago, a very tight Senate race in Missouri I was involved in, uh, the uh, lieutenant governor ran against an incumbent senator and a very, very rich man, uh, and he won and spent $260,000. Very ran, good man. And then, and then they ran in the general against a congressman who had been there for years, and they spent $270,000. Uh, multiply that to what that is wor worth today in inflation, et cetera. But today, it was unheard of for a congressional race to cost a million dollars. Today, a congressional race might cost $10 million. So the influence of money is there. Don't ever think it isn't. By the way, you mentioned that he's raised $100 million so far. I would bet that by the time we get to November of 2020, each of the major party nominees will have in the primaries and the general spent a billion dollars. Oh, yeah, for sure. It'll be a $2 billion election. For sure. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to not choose you. No. He doesn't like the Nike shirt. That's I the problem. I love Nike. 1972. I, I mean, you might even know who Eddie, Teddy Kennedy was. So to, to crystallize, does the panel believe that the federal presidential campaign finance laws and a post-Citizens United world are healthy or harmful for American democracies? And what measures, if any, should be taken to limit the influence of wealthy donors, uh, even though their influence doesn't necessarily manifest as quid pro quo, but does manifest as increased access? Um, I, I mean, the head of the AFL-CEO has more access than any donor, period, okay? So don't, don't necessarily assume that cash is the most valuable asset. I'm just, I'm just, if, you have, if you represent a lot of people 
or a, a cause, you can have that kind of access to. Um, I, the, the, the campaign finance laws needs to be brought up to speed on where the country is today. This construct that we have, you know, general primary, you can't raise money in the general till the primary is over. You know, the matching funds, which will never be done before. It all needs to be updated. But as, as, the, as the ambassador said, in Washington, campaign finance is really not Republican versus Democrat. Uh, I think we need to get dark money out. I think we need to have greater restrictions on uh, PACs, both independent PACs and c candidates' PACs. And I, I think that there ought to be a, a view of limits, how much you can raise. Uh, theoretically, in Iowa, there's a limit on how much you can raise. Uh, and if you, well, what happens if you raise more? Their election commission slaps you on the wrist. So I'm f from the school that I would love to get big money out of politics. And you'd like to put a total cap on what a candidate can raise spend. and spend. So I would be opposed to that because if I'm if I if I don't know anybody and I'm running against Barack Obama for re-election, I have no chance because he's on television every night on NBC News, ABC News, and he's got the power of the White House, which is the biggest campaign operation in the history of the world. Uh, so it, it depends on what you want. If you want the ability for other people to have a voice, uh, then I would, I would not be for limiting. I'm for the libertarian kind of view, which is I would get rid of super PACs. Though getting rid of anything is really hard because, you know, the court has ruled that spending is speech. So we'll put the legality aside. But I, don't, I think super PACs and particularly dark money organizations are very problematical. I would remove the $2,600 level on what people can give an actual candidate. Instant disclosure. They're responsible for taking the check, and they totally control how it's spent with full disclosure. So the buck stops with the person on the ballot. Um, but that would raise the amount of money people could give. But then you can debate it. I'm not going to vote for Snodgrass because he took 100000 from Bob Shaw or whatever. Uh, but I think caps are a bit arbitrary, particularly when we spend more money on pet food than, uh, than we do on politics. Now, uh, and pornography, to, remember. Yeah, <laughs> not to mention pet food and pornography. Then you get into real dollars. If we were to make television ads cheaper um, or the cost of communication cheaper, then it's something to talk about. Sir, over here. Hey, guys. Uh, my name's Neil, and... So you guys mentioned a lot of reasons people give. So I was really curious, what do you guys do on the fundraising side to kind of elicit that? And especially with the rise of the internet and uh, how you get people to donate through the internet. I think it's the message. Yeah. Strictly the message. Uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in all the Democrats uh, will have a form of a message anti-Trump. Uh, that we'll put out there and what resonates will cause people to give. I think that uh, when Beto O'Rourke ran against Cruz, and you can say this, it was more, it was equally Beto, but it was equal anti-Cruz. He was very unpopular. Uh, and by the way, he, he won by three percentage points in a very, very red state. So the answer to your first question is how do you get people to give on the Internet? I think it's the message. The second uh, way is you've got to be creative. I will tell you one of my greatest fundraiser successes. In 1980, Teddy Kennedy ran against the President of the United States, Jimmy Carter. Uh, it was a Don Quixote campaign. In my state of uh, Missouri, uh, I had the two senators against me, the congressman and the governor, and I was supposed to raise money. I didn't know how I was going to raise money. So I came up with the most creative idea I've ever had. I brought in Jacqueline Kennedy to have a fundraiser. We, out, we sold it out, and many Republicans gave because they just wanted to come meet Jackie. My point being is it's how you reach out to people, what they want to hear, what they want to see. Uh, but in the Internet, it's all message, in my opinion. My, my goal is to make you feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself. And that your role in that is not just to write a check, but that you have other pieces to which your life can become a bigger player into the world that you're trying to have an impact on. So I'm trying to figure out what motivates you, how to talk to you, what you like, and hopefully get your birthday so I can send you a birthday note. 
I'm going to make sure you sign up for something that out of a million people, one person's going to get to go hang out backstage with my candidate before he or she goes on stage. I'm just going to try to find ways to make you engage more than just one time in what we're trying to accomplish. And that's a big part of message, but it's also personalization and making you feel like you were something, where you're involved in something bigger than yourself. And the huge thing is this is a flip. In the old days, you'd raise the money from the bundlers. You'd hire people like Mir Shrum to work on the message and put up advertising to move the polls to raise more money to win. Now you get the message right and you put it on the Internet, then the money comes in. So it used to be money, then message. Now it's message, then money. Uh, so one more quick question. Wherever. I can't see very well. So, If the Supreme Court does remove individual campaign contribution limits, which does seem possible now, uh, what do you think will be the main impacts on American politics when it comes to campaigns? Well, it will certainly not be good for people who organize super PACs. Uh, uh, you'll have you'll have you'll have people giving. Some people will give more money. Some people will give less. My guess is you won't have a lot more money in the system than you otherwise would. You probably have in the situation where it's disclosure is more to the candidate, so that he or she can control the message themselves. You'll have more transparency in that regard, and you won't have this dark money concern. There will be lots of people who will, will think that it's you know going to cause lots of problems. Look, at the end of the day, and this sounds very idealistic. If you don't like somebody, don't vote for them. If you think they're a crook, don't vote for them. If you think they're taking money from somebody they shouldn't be taking money for, don't vote for them. Tell your friends. Tell your sister. Tell your partner. Tell whomever it is. Engage in the conversation of trying to stop them. That, that's the one thing that, 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 that we've learned is you can stop the system. It happened, almost happened with Bernie Sanders. It sure happened in the Republican primary. The voters said, enough with you. We think it's great you think that, you know, Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz or Chris Christie's best things in sliced bread. We want somebody who's going to come up and blow up the system, and they did it, and they beat all of us along the way. The same thing was true. I mean, the same thing happened to Hillary the first time against Barack Obama, and almost happened to her the second time against Bernie Sanders. If the system would have been allowed to happen, she never would have been the nominee. So you can do that. It's there, and we've just seen the last two cycles, an example on the Republican side, an example on the Democratic side, where the voters spoke, and they, in one case they won, and in the other case they almost won. I think your question was, if they take out the limits, what's the impact? I, is that what you were saying? Uh, I think it will be horrendous. You will see the rise of special interest groups. You'll see the rise of uh, individuals giving enormous amounts of monies. You'll see situations where candidates will try and buy the election. I still think there'll be packs of some kind. But uh, what's Mayor Bloomberg do if there's no limits? Mayor Bloomberg today in the Democratic Party, if he could buy the election, he'd win. But you can't buy the election in Iowa. You can't buy the election in New Hampshire. Uh, it turns out that uh, here's a man that's got umpteen billions, and he wants to be president, and he doesn't know how to do it. Uh, so all I can suggest to you is uh, your uh, assumption that they take off the limits, I hope, never happens. Uh, we're going to wind up. I, I have to, to conclude with a, a short story. Uh, in 1860, at the Republican Convention, Abraham Lincoln was fighting hard against someone named William Seward from New York for the Republican nomination. He would later appoint him his Secretary of State, thus team of rivals. Uh, and there was a very corrupt governor of Pennsylvania named Simon Cameron who said, I'll throw our votes to Lincoln if, uh, if Lincoln will agree to make me Secretary of the Treasury. And Lincoln, sort of anticipating this, neither to cover his rear end or because he really felt it, uh, sent a telegram to his campaign manager, David Davis, whom Lincoln later appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court, so lots of things stay the same, by the way. Uh, and the telegram said, make no deals, I will be bound by none. And Davis looked at it and he said, Lincoln ain't here, made the deal. They wouldn't appoint Simon Cameron in the end, Secretary of, of uh, the Treasury, because he was an incredible thief. Uh, they have made him Secretary of War, and a year in, he got caught making uh, profiteering off uh, the making of uniforms for soldiers. 
Uh, and so they sent him to, you'll like this, Lou, they sent him to St. Petersburg which, as the ambassador, which in 1862 was about as far as you could be sent in the world. You'd never be heard of again. So the, the human nature doesn't change in politics. Fundraising is part of that human nature. I want to thank Jack. This was great. I want to thank Lou. I have so many things to thank Lou for over so many years. And uh, it's great to do this with Murphy. And I want to thank Lisa Korbatov, whose generosity has helped make so many of these programs possible. Thank you all, and we'll see you next week, and we'll talk about the Democrats. Thank you.